Okay, hello and welcome to week 12. Nearly finished. Uh, and there are uh, 10 of you here. <clears throat> hello to the viewers at home, of whom I hope there are many dozens. Um, <clears throat> all right. <coughs> oh, gosh. Great start. Uh, just those of you who are here, how are you getting on with the projects? You doing okay? Yeah. Anybody kind of super worried or anything? And any questions about your project? Because if, if you do, uh, you can come down at the end and we'll just, you know, there's a little bit of extra time on, in the room here uh, so I can talk to you if you've got like a question about your work in progress, uh, just if you wish. Right, uh, so I'll assume that's all going fine. And I'll just get on with the meat of today's topic, which is going to be AI. It's a particular favourite of mine, this one. Um, <clears throat> okay. Right. So... AI, obviously, artificial intelligence, a huge subject, very interesting, deep subject. Um, there you go, it's huge, complex, fascinating, philosophically profound, and, uh, you know, in, in its full flowering could have a big impact on the world. <clears throat> um, but, of course, I can't cover the whole breadth of AI here, just on a couple of lectures this week, um, but I will make an attempt to do a kind of survey of it. Out of interest, how many of you study AI as a separate subject, and you do it like a course, right? And, and is it called AI or is it specific machine learning? Uh, one is called machine learning and it's a separate one for reinforcement learning. Right, okay. So those, those are fairly specific to those sub-branches though. So I won't be going into like huge detail on anything like that. There wouldn't be time for it. Um, what I'm going to do is a mixture of like an overview of AI as a field, which I find kind of interesting. So I'll have a bit of like history in it again. Uh, and then I'll drop down to some of the specific things about the AI that's in games. Uh, to me, the slightly disappointing thing is that I'm, I'm very interested in like, the whole question of artificial intelligence. You know, can machines think? Does, does that make sense? Uh, could, could we do it? Um, so I'm an AI enthusiast. Uh, but the sad fact is that the kind of AI you get in computer games is, is mostly fairly simple. I mean, I have a couple of my friends who kind of work as AI programmers, and I by no means wish to denigrate them. You know, they, just like everybody else, we're doing, we're doing work making games. Uh, but, you know, AI in games is it's mostly root finding, isn't it? And a little bit of simple decision making about strategy, maybe in some games, sometimes what we call state machines that just do things like deciding, you know, am I attacking? Am I defending? It's really quite primitive and it doesn't get anywhere near the kind of big philosophical questions about AI that, that I happen to be interested in. So as I kind of indicated, this lecture will be a mixture of some like very broad, what is AI all about stuff. Uh, and then occasionally I'll drop down to practical things that you do in games. And I'm also going to do a bit about popular culture, because AI is one of these things that's had been a lot of influence on science fiction and, and movies and so on. And I just happen to like all that. So I've got a bit of that in the mix as well. <clears throat> so let's, let's start by looking at some of the, the, the sort of theoretical foundations of AI, what I would call real AI. So this is like the, you know, the, the big question, can we make machines think, that kind of stuff not can we make them work out how you get from A to B, which is a, a simpler problem. Um, so AI actually goes back a long way. It goes right back to 1950 um, and a paper called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, which is one of the, the things that Alan Turing did. Uh, how many of you know about Computing Machinery and Intelligence? Have you heard of that paper before? One. See, I think most people haven't. It's weird. It's, it's a fairly, to me, it's an important part of Turing's contribution. But it's maybe not like the academically central one. You know, the central one is like the Turing machines, computability theory, and then practical people care about the cryptography work and the war, you know, the code breaking. But he, he, had, he had many strings to his bow, and, uh, and one of them was that he thought a lot about AI. He considered it to be an interesting problem. Uh, so he wrote this paper that's actually really good, and it's not very long. It's like about 20-odd pages, uh, and I'm going to suggest that you read it if you happen to be keen. I realise actually persuading students to go and read an academic paper is sometimes a bit of an uphill climb. I've tried to make it easy for you though. I have, I have created a really good readable version of the paper because if you search for online, you can find it, but you often find bad OCR scans of it that are full of errors. You know, when you do OCR on technical papers, like the, you know, the superscripts get mangled and all the squares become twos and the tables don't come through properly, it's a mess. So I actually spent quite a lot of time uh, one weekend going back to the very original scans of this, it was published in a philosophy magazine called Mind, because there weren't computer science magazines yet, you know, there weren't computer science journals, so it's a philosophy paper um, from Mind, and, uh, and I just took it and wrote it out and uh, annotated it and everything, so that it's a complete description of what was actually in that 
that paper back in the day, uh, so it's all there for you. Um, and done any sections as well to help you understand it. You may want to take a look at it. I might mention it in the exam. Uh, that kind of thing. Okay, so this is one of Turing's many achievements, and it's an interesting thing to read. Um, Turing, of course, I mean, you know, as I say, he did a lot of things, and I think there's always this question, it's like, you know, what does it mean to say that someone's a genius? Uh, but if you're, you know, is, is genius like a totally superpower type of thing that's different from normal humans, or is it just someone who's really, really good at what they do? Um, and I don't know, but if you're going to use the word at all, Turing is probably one of the people you would call a genius if you go and just search his Google page as to how you prove whether someone's a genius or not. Okay, he's got 11, 11 counts of genius in his article and his paper, uh, so I guess that proves that he must have been one. Um, and the nice thing about this paper is it's, it's pretty readable because, first of all, it's only intended for philosophers, uh, <laughs> so it's not hard. Um, I joke a little bit. Uh, but it's, it's not super technical because there is no super technical yet. It's only 1950. You know, there's no code in it or anything like that. Uh, in fact, he actually has to explain what computers are because he's aiming at an audience of people who might not really know what they are yet because they're brand new. So there's a good introduction in here as to what a computer is and just some of the basic questions. And I think it's fairly readable and it gives you an insight into what a genius uh, was thinking about this question back in the day. So uh, have a go at it. And it, does, it begins with the famous line, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? Which is kind of the central AI puzzle. Uh, of course, you maybe know that uh, Turing was portrayed in the, the film The Imitation Game. Anyone seen that? Yeah. OK, so I mean, it's, it's kind of OK as far as it goes, but it takes a lot of liberties. You know, it's a very fictionalized account. In fact, I actually think its portrayal of Turing's personality is not even right, based on what I know of him from other sources. Um, so, you know, uh, Always take those sort of Hollywood films with a grain of salt. They, they definitely distorted some facts, and they just got like some the, the basic narrative sort of okay. But they, you know, you shouldn't take it as history, right? Uh, there's actually another one that was made back in the 90s called Breaking the Code, which is can actually be found on YouTube, and it's a bit more realistic, a bit more somber, uh, based on a play. Um, got De Derek Jacobi, good good actor, plays uh, Turing in it, and that's one that's maybe a bit more historically close to the truth. Uh, if you if you care about those things, <clears throat> so the thing that uh, the computing machinery and intelligence paper introduces is the thing that's called the imitation game, right? That's where the name of the film comes from. It's from this idea here, which is about a little contest he proposes um, about well to answer the question: Can machines think? And you can kind of read it here in your own time if you like. But the the interesting thing is Turing has to think. Well, okay, my question is: Can machines think? Um, being a nerd, he has to think about his definitions very carefully. So uh, he needs to know, well, what is a machine, which we'll get to in a bit, and also what is think? H what is thinking, right? I mean, do we know? Do we have a? You know, you need to know what it is in order to know whether you can you can do it. You can satisfy a definition of it. So he comes up with this idea for thinking that's very pragmatic. He doesn't say that it's anything about you know biology or biochemistry or anything about neurons or anything like that. He just says that well, thinking is is the thing that people do. You know that you know you know it when you see it that type of thing. So he just says that thinking is the ability to have like a, a an intelligent conversation with someone is kind of proof of thinking because that's how we we kind of assume that our fellow humans are thinking. We can talk to them and they they, they know what we're saying and they generate ideas. The Turing test websites. Yes. So the so the idea of the imitation game was that uh, as he initially formulates, it, you've got a man and a woman and they're both concealed from an interrogator, so they're working at like a teletyper or something. And the initial version of it is the man is trying to pretend that he's a woman um, uh, and, the, and the interrogator is trying to work out who's the man and who's the woman and they're trying to kind of pretend to be the other, right? And he has to figure it out. And then at the end he says, and let's just swap in, replace the man with the computer. So the idea is that you've got a computer behind a, a screen somewhere that's interacting and having a conversation with you. And the idea is it's trying to sound like a real human, actually literally a woman, although people forget that and they just say a person. Um, so the computer is trying to pretend to be a person and there's a human also trying to pretend to be a person. And the idea is that, uh, you know, that uh, the, the, the decision maker has to decide. You know, he knows that one of them's a computer and he knows that one of them's real and he has to make the decision. So the question is, uh, could you write, could you build a computer that would be able to trick them like more than 50 percent of the time? It's actually a little bit different from that, but that's roughly the idea. Uh, so that's the imitation game. Um, 
So there's a lot wrong with this formulation. Uh, the, the biggest thing that's wrong with saying that this is how we define uh, intelligence is it constrains intelligence to the human mold. We basically said that intelligence is a thing that humans do, which might be unfair. You know, there might be other types of intelligence that don't have human-like behavior entirely. For example, there could be intelligent things that are cleverer than humans, and you'd be able to tell them apart from humans because they could do things that we can't do. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not quite right to constrain it to, to human abilities. Um, so that's kind of a prejudice. But Turing knows this, and he mentions it in the paper that this is a, you know, a limitation. But the idea is that, yeah, but if you could make a machine that, that communicated as well as a human, that would that would still be a good milestone. You know, you could maybe have one that was even better or that was clever in different domains. But if you could be human-like, that would be uh, sufficient to, to kind of prove there was some sort of intelligence. Um, so that was, that was sort of the idea there. Uh, in fact, there, you actually see a little bit of this in the paper itself. There's a subtle little thing where he's showing an example of a dialogue that you might have with this supposed intelligence, and you're trying to work out whether it's a machine or a human, and you ask it some questions and so on. And there's one of the things here where the questioner asks it to do a little bit of arithmetic. Now, of course, a computer could answer that question uh, instantly. right? Uh, but because the job is not be intelligent, the job is pretend to be human, uh, what the respondent does is the respondent actually pauses for about 30 seconds, which a computer wouldn't need to do, but maybe a human would to do the mental arithmetic. And, uh, and the other killer thing, which the paper itself does not mention, but I spotted when I read it as a teenager, gets it wrong, uh, which is also very human, right? A human forgets to do the carry here. Uh, so, this is, so he actually gives slightly the wrong answer. And that would be, and if anything, would be more convincing for a human than for a machine. You see? Uh, just a funny little detail there. OK. Uh, so that's the imitation game, right? The imitation game is also known as the Turing test. Um, but he doesn't call it the Turing test, because again, it's considered bad form to name things after yourself. The same with Moore's Law. If you go and read the Moore's Law paper, it doesn't say Moore's Law in it. It just describes the thing, and then someone else calls it Moore's Law later. So again, the imitation game got called the Turing test by other people. So it's the same thing. You've, uh, you've heard of the Turing test. Is that be right? Yeah, so you sort of know what it is. Have you heard of the Voigtkampf empathy test? No. Got only one. Okay. Are you sure you haven't heard of the Voigtkampf empathy test? Have you seen Blade Runner? Who hasn't seen Blade Runner? Oh, see, this is really... I know there's a generational divide between us, but there are certain classic films that you need to see. So you need to watch Blade Runner. Um, do you know what Blade Runner's about? Not so much, OK. Uh, so it's... Um, so it's set in the distant future of 2019 in Los Angeles, and uh, and uh, Harrison Ford is tracking down a bunch of rogue, they're called replicants, but we can think of them as humanoid robots. There's actually a question as to whether they're really robots. I don't want to get into that. From my point of view, they're robots. Um, and they're, they're these renegade robots that are built to do like menial labor and all this kind of thing, but sometimes they go crazy, uh, and you need to catch them and kill them. Um, and one of the things they do, the thing is the robots are very convincingly human looking. Um, so they, they actually have a psychological test that they do on a suspect to try and figure out whether it's a, a, a replicant or a real human. And that, in, in the film, which is fictional so far, uh, it's called the Voigtkampf empathy test. But basically it's the Turing test. It's the same idea. I'm pretty sure that the guy who wrote the, the, the film is based on a book by Philip K. Dick, a good science fiction writer. And I'm pretty sure that Dick knew he was doing the Turing test. So anyway, uh, so I'm going to show you this clip of the Voigtkampf empathy test, where this is the interrogator. And he's trying to work out whether the guy at the other end of the table is a human or a robot that's been programmed to think it's a human. right? And, uh, and you'll see how that plays out.
So I think that's actually quite good because you can see in that scene, uh, he, he is a replicant, if you hadn't guessed. Uh, you can see the tension that he doesn't he doesn't fully understand the concepts. You know, he's too literal, like, you know, what's a tortoise? And he feels very stressed at trying to sort of pretend to be real. So because the idea is that the replicants, they, they aren't, they're, they're sort of emotionally immature because they've just been recently created. So they don't have real life experience. So they, they aren't like totally plausible as, as humans. So that's the idea of that test. Okay. Uh, so anyway, so Turing's paper, um, he has that definition of what's, think, uh, what's thinking, and he describes that as the ability to converse plausibly with a human. And then the other part is, well, what's a machine? Because can a machine think? And it's that machine could mean lots of things. So he tries to define what machines are for the purposes of the test. So he suggests, well, how about anything that human engineers can create? We use that as a definition of a machine. But Turing's clever, and he realizes that that's got a loophole in it, because one of the things that human engineers can create is baby engineers uh, in the usual manner. As it is, it's, got, it's got jokes in it, this paper. People don't realize it's quite funny. I mean, it's not like ha-ha funny, but it's, you know, he's a clever guy. Um, so you have to kind of rule that out. So he says, well, OK, how about I insist that the engineers all have to be of one sex? So obviously we'll say female, because we're getting any trouble. So you have a bunch of female engineers, uh, so they can't reproduce in the ordinary way, and you see anything that female engineers can make, or separately male engineers working across a partition. Uh, but that's not perfect either, because of a problem called, uh, that would be cheating, yes, uh, but there's also a problem called cloning. <laughs> he's writing this in 1950, right? Cloning hadn't happened yet. We didn't, you know, Dolly the Sheep cloning is like a 1990s thing, uh, and so on. But, but cloning was... Cloning was something that people were aware of the concept of, although uh, maybe not a lot of people, though. Um, for example, Watson and Crick hadn't discovered the, the true structure of DNA yet. That didn't happen until 1953. Uh, DNA, the molecule itself, had been discovered earlier, but they didn't fully understand what it was for. Um, but the idea of cloning did exist. Actually, some science fiction that was written like back in the 1930s speculated about cloning. That They knew in theory there was something in the cell and that if you were clever, you could maybe suck that thing out and you could grow organisms without, you know, all of the usual machinery that's normally involved. Um, so he has to rule out cloning as well uh, in this theoretical lab that's making machines. Because, well, cloning would be, you know, a great scientific achievement, he says. It doesn't really help us to answer this question about whether machines can think. So he says, no, uh, he says, the type of machine I'm talking about is this thing called a digital computer. Uh, and these are just new, and that's why he has to then go and explain what they are. And it's really quite good if you read that part of it, he tries to explain to a, an educated audience you know, what computers are really all about. Um, 
And what he says is that basically a computer is a general purpose machine uh, that can follow any set of instructions that you can give it as long as you can enumerate them very clearly. And it will just execute them reliably and slavishly. And that's what a computer is. Um, a bit like an office clerk, which in the past were indeed called computers. Remember I said back in first lecture with Babbage that computer used to mean a person who computed for a living, a person who just did calculations. And that's the kind of thing he's talking about. Uh, so these uh, these uh, non-human computers, these artificial computers, they've, they've got a memory, which is a bit like the notepad that a clerk would have that they can you know, do temporary working on. Um, and they can perform arithmetic. They can do basic if-then decisions. You know, if the answer is positive, do one thing. If it's negative, do another thing. And they can you know, do different instructions. And that's it. And it turns out that is a complete description of what computers are. You know, this is kind of like um, a more prosaic way of describing the Turing machine. You know, the Turing machine, the super simple machine with the paper tape and everything, just a theoretical thing. It just represents the, 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 the simple elementary things that a computer would have to have to be able to do anything. And that's basically it. It's uh, some simple arithmetic decision making, bit of memory, and that's you got a computer. So what computers actually are is they are discrete state machines, at least digital ones are. Um, so the idea is the, the digital machine, it's got, you know, got a memory and those bits in the memory are either on or off. And you could just enumerate and you could say, OK, the state of the memory of this machine is 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, whatever it is, so many bits as it's got. And given that state, which is going to be partly memory and partly the program, uh, that basically just tells you everything about what the machine is going to do next, because it's going to execute an instruction and that will change some things in memory. And then it'll execute another instruction. It just keeps turning over. So it just goes from state to state to state to state. And that's it. And if you know where it is at any time, you can theoretically predict where it will be in the future, basically just by, by running it. And it'll click, click, click. Uh, that's what it is. It's like a replay system. Uh, computers are kind of like that, right? Um, and Turing mentions that the number of possible states in the machine that he was working on, the, the Manchester baby that I, again, mentioned previously, this thing here, the Manchester Mark I, Right. That was the machine that Turing actually worked on and uh, wrote programs for occasionally. Um, okay, uh, the, that machine um, has about two to the power 165,000 potential states. Now you just know from looking at it, that's a big number, isn't it? It really is. Um, <clears throat> also, if you want to, uh, turns out if you want to convert two to the power numbers to ten to the power, for those of you that still think in ten to the power, you've still got decimal brains. Uh, basically, what you do is you, you divide the exponent by about three uh, to convert, you know, a two to the power to ten to the power. So you divide this by three, and you get about uh, fifty thousand. So it's ten to the power of fifty thousand. So that's a one with fifty thousand zeros after it. It's a large number, and that's the number of states he had in that very primitive uh, Manchester computer way back in the day, which is like that's a huge number of states. But what does that actually mean? Um, if it's got that many states, how much memory has it got? It's like one, two, eight, six, eight, eight, eight. Yep, exactly. Each, each state is a bit, so it's got that many bits. So oh, how many right. bytes is that, roughly? That's a two to the power of uh, 18,000. Well, it's easier oh, that, you, to, to, convert, to convert bits to bytes, divide by eight. And it's easy yeah. to divide 16 by eight, you get two. Yeah. So that's two with uh, four zeros, so it's 20,000. So it's 20,000 bytes, which is 20K. It only had 20k, not 20 meg, not 20 gig, 20k, right? The size of like an image. Um, but it just turns out that yeah, a 20 a 20k image does in fact potentially contain that many states. It's just it's just the way the numbers work out. So yes, a 20 kilobyte machine <clears throat> still had this like absolutely staggering number of potential states that it could be in. Um, that's just that's just how it works. Um, other interesting thing about this paper. It's kind of peripheral to his main discussion, but at one point he's talking about um, he's talking about small changes in the world. Uh, so when he talks about displacement, right? Displacement. Um, one of the nice things about a digital computer is once you know what state it's in, you've got it's kind of precise. Unlike analog computers, which were also a thing, analog computers weren't zero and one; they were continuous values, which meant they were very hard to know exactly what their value was because it was it was a you know a, a real number. Um, the problem is that with, a, with things that are not digital, very small changes uh, could cause you know, huge cascading effects in the future. But the nice thing about a digital machine is that as a discrete state machine, you don't have to worry about that. If you know the state of it, that's, you, know, you have an accurate snapshot of the state. 
Uh, but he mentions that for other things it's not the case, and that in an analog system, um, a very small displacement, like an electron, that's just a little bit different from where you think it is, could have a, a cascading effect that might make somebody be killed by an avalanche a year later uh, from a tiny change. Now, how many of you recognise that sentiment of the small change becoming super big over time? Butterfly effect. Butterfly effect, right. But Turing's doing this in 1950, and the butterfly effect wasn't coined until 1972. Um, so yes, so what, what part of what's interesting is you read this paper by like a really clever guy who's speculating about a bunch of stuff, and you see things in there like cloning, butterfly effect, chaos theory. Um, now he wasn't really inventing these things, but people knew that small changes could amplify, right? I mean that is the sort of understood, but. It, is the, it turns out the butterfly effect was not coined until the 70s, although people had done work on similar things. Um, the idea of chaos theory would maybe relate to this. Again, it didn't, that came in the 70s, but there had been work on it by mathematicians earlier than that. So there's just a lot of stuff in the paper. Um, there's also another little reference. Does anyone, anyone know the story of Sound of Thunder? No? Science fiction story by Ray Bradbury about some people who go back in time. And, uh, and make a small change to the world. And when they come into the future, the future's totally different. Basically, it's the plot of Back to the Future. Uh, but it was written as, as science fiction in 1952. So again, slightly later than Turing. And it's again about that idea about small changes. Having, like somebody goes back in time and they, they, uh, they, 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 they step on an insect. And then when they come back to the future, millions of years back into the future, the world is completely different because of like, one little insect. Uh, it's quite a good story. Um, so just a whole bunch of good ideas in the paper. That's why I, I recommend reading it. Um, but the, maybe the core part of this paper is uh, Turing has a, a list of... So Turing was pro-AI. He thought AI could be done. Uh, I think his basic argument, I would say, to paraphrase, is he thinks that you know the human brain, marvellous thing and all that, complicated, wonderful uh, result of evolution, but it's not magic. You know, It's not supernatural. It's a bunch of atoms that being the laws of physics, like everything else. And in some sense, it's like, well, if you knew what the laws were and you could understand what was going on in the neurons, you know, it's again, it's, it shouldn't be supernatural. You could somehow describe that and implement that in some other mechanism, you know, implement it using machinery. And in theory, you know, maybe maybe really hard, maybe it'd be dead difficult, but in theory, you could kind of transpose that computation that the brain is doing into some other device and it would work. That was sort of what he seemed to think. But he gives a bunch of objections that people might have to the idea of AI which are all listed here, right? Um, so I've got them all in a bit of detail. Uh, but to run over them briskly, there are things like uh, a kind of the religious argument that, that basically uh, humans have got special properties by virtue of having a soul, and that uh, and that machines could never have that. And then he points out, well, you know, who's to say that God didn't give souls to elephants and whales? Uh, how do we know? At what point did God decide that souls were supposed to get breathed into bodies or not, if you believe that? Um, he also mentions, actually, uh, the Muslim view that women don't have souls, which I thought was a bit much. I tried to check into this. As far as I know, it's not uh, part of mainstream Islam to claim that women don't have souls, but there's a, a set called the Alawites that, are, that maybe think that women don't have souls. I don't want to get into any difficult territory, but I just tried to find out why, why Turing thought that about, the, uh, thought that about, about Islam. Um, there's a head, heads in the sands objection, which is that it would be bad if you could create machines that would think, because, uh, you know, they would take over the world or something, or it would be upsetting. And it's like, well, that's not an argument, though, is it? That's just, that's just a fear. Um, there are some better arguments like maths and Google. I don't know if you know about Google's incompleteness theory, but there's these ideas that there are things that that maths can't do, problems that can't be... In fact, the, the limitations of a Turing machine, you know, undecidable problems, the halting problem, stuff like that. So the idea is that, well, we, we, we know theoretically there are some things that machines can't do. Uh, maybe that means they can't think. But Turing's counter would be, well, we don't know that, you know, those, we don't know those limitations prevent thinking. And we also don't know that human brains are, are free from such limitations. I mean, there are things that humans can't do as well. So you can't necessarily conclude that just because computers can't do everything, uh, that they can't think. Um, consciousness is another one of these things. It's like, is consciousness a very special... Consciousness is, consciousness is a very hard thing to figure out. You know, this business about how we are aware of our own thinking, that we you know that we know that we're, we're not just doing it, we know that we're doing it, which is like, there's some sort of weird, strange twist there. You could kind of imagine a machine that could do the stuff, but would it really know that it was doing it? You know, it's hard to think of a machine being able to do that, but, but we can do it, so wh where's the magic, right? So that's one of the hard objections. 
And then there's a, a bunch of general objections of the form that machines can't do X, you know, which just means they can't do X and get, you know, they can't write poetry, they can't, you know, they can't uh, fall in love or this kind of thing. Uh, and Turing would just say, well, you're just saying they can't do that yet, but that doesn't prove it couldn't be made to happen in the future. Uh, there's also the Lady Lovelace objection. Uh, and he calls it that, he gives it the name. So that shows that some people claim that, you know, Lady Lovelace was, that uh, Ada Lovelace was kind of forgotten about in computing history. It's not actually true. Turing knew about her and she was discussed um, in the early days of computing. There's a programming language was named after her in the 70s that the US military used. So it's not as if she was actually like a, she wasn't really a forgotten figure, although she's sometimes presented that way. Um, but he mentions the Lady Lovelace's objection, which is the one about originality. You know, it's that uh, could, the, the machine can only do what you tell it to do. Um, so how could it do something like, you know, compose a symphony or something like that? But again, there are, you can argue that, well, you know, there's obviously some process going on when humans compose a symphony. And if you knew what it was and you could encode that in a machine, the machine could do it too. Um, this is a good one, the nervous system not being discrete. There's definitely potentially a difference between things that are only got discrete states and things that have continuous states. And we do think, as far as we know, well, maybe, maybe uh, the nervous system is continuous and not discrete. But Turing's argument was that for any continuous analog system, you can get as close as you like to accuracy by just sampling it at a higher frequency. But when we, we make audio samples, you know, you can do it at 44 kilohertz or 196 kilohertz, and you just the, the, the better you sample it, the closer you get to the truth. So he just felt that you could eventually get a discrete system that would be uh, good enough. And it's also the case that we don't absolutely know that real nervous systems are totally continuous. That becomes a physics question. Uh, and then informality of behavior, the idea that you, know, you think that, uh, that human intelligence, that we... Uh, we aren't entirely rule following, whereas machines would be totally rigorously rule following. But again, it's just that, well, what are the rules? You could make rules that have got a certain degree, degree of flexibility built into them. And again, our, you know, our human, I mean, your, your brain isn't breaking the laws of physics when it's doing stuff, uh, even if you're sometimes not obeying the laws of the, the highway code or whatever it might be. Uh, so, oh, and it's the classic one at the end. Uh, one of Turing's objections that he thought was a good objection to AI was the apparent fact of extrasensory perception. Uh, Turing writes that the statistical evidence, at least for telepathy, is overwhelming. And he thought that this appears to be a magical thing that humans can do and that you couldn't see how machines could do it. So this was quite a good objection to AI, that, uh, the blooming mean, telepathy. So there you go, a genius, right, who was like super clever and, uh, and he apparently thought that telepathy was a plausible thing. I can make a slight excuse for him. There had been work done in the 50s. There was published research by a guy called Sam Soule, uh, a mathematician and, and parapsychologist, who published papers allegedly showing that people could do kind of psychic stuff. You know, have you ever seen the original Ghostbusters with Bill Murray when he's got the Zener cards with the wavy lines and the stars and stuff and he's trying to guess them? That, that's used in parapsychology. Um, so apparently, I don't know whether Soul did exactly that, but he did these various tests that appeared to show that people could like, psychically send thoughts to one another. And of course, it was all fraud, right? Because people actually can't do that. I'm telling you now. Um, but uh, but it was he, he was sort of respectable until he got caught. So it po it's possible that Turing knew this work and thought that, oh gosh, there some, seems to be something that human brains can do that we don't understand, which would be a big barrier. But I don't think anyone takes this one terribly seriously these days. Although, who knows? Got to keep an open mind, right? But I don't think ESP is possible. So I'm, I'm saying I, I think Shuren was wrong on that point. Um, OK, but uh, so what did Shuren actually believe? So he says in the paper, direct quote, then about 50 years time, that'd be the year 2000, it would be possible to program computers with a storage capacity of 10 to the 9 bits and make them play the imitation game so well that an average interrogator will not have more than a 70% chance of making the right identification after five minutes of questioning. You need to think what 70% means, right? Because uh, the ideal thing, if you, were as, if you were sort of perfect at it, if you made a computer that was just as good as a human, what would the probability be of you getting, guessing right as which is a human and which is the machine? Be 50-50. And what if it was rubbish? What would the probability be if it was like a rubbish computer? Be 100, right? You'd, you'd always identify the human. So on a sliding scale from 100, which is the machine is rubbish, to 50, which is the machine is as good as a human, Turing is saying 70. So he still thought that you know, most of the time you could tell it was a machine, 
but you wouldn't always be able to tell. It would it wouldn't be terrible. It would be kind of maybe, you know, I don't know, two thirds of the way towards being able to convince people, whatever seventy percent literally means, right? So he thought that an average interrogator, you know, a man off the street, take a man off the street and you connect them to a chatbot and a real human for was it five minutes, yeah? Uh, and you get him to say which is the chatbot and which is the human, and he thought that that's where we would be at. Um, so he was wrong about that as well, right? I mean, we just know that didn't happen. But again, you know, it wasn't stupid, it wasn't utterly outrageous, it was a bit optimistic, um, and he, 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 was, he was off on that one. Just to put it in context, a capacity of 10 to the 9 bits is what we would call 120 megabytes. Um, and he's talking about the year 2000. In the year 2000, a Mac G4 Cube, which was a fancy computer back in the year 2000, had 128 mega RAM, which is not far away from that. It also had 20 giga disk, though. And I think, to be fair, you have to include, you probably have to include disk in the storage of the machine. So if you only look at the RAM, it's like, oh my God, he got that estimate quite good. But if you include the, the disk, then he didn't. Um, and as to the question about, you know, could a machine throw you in the Turing test back in 2000? You most certainly could not. Um, in fact, people tried it. Uh, there's a thing called the Loebner Prize, which was given over a couple of decades from, I think, maybe the 90s or the 80s onwards, where they would actually try and run a Turing test. They would take chatbots and they would, they would do this and try and see whether the, the bots could convince panelists that they were human. Have you, have you heard of the Loebner test? No? It's kind of, it's fairly obscure, but, you know, uh, AI people know about it. They don't take it seriously because it's kind of a farce for reasons that will soon become obvious. But this was the thing that happened. They didn't run it last year, and I think it's maybe stopped now. But right up to 2019, every year they did a contest where they tried to tell, see if they could tell chatbots from real humans. Um, so I couldn't find the results from the year 2000, which is Turing's prediction year, but I could find the results from 2001. And here's here's the one that, this is the, the winner, right? This was the best of the chatbots. But of course, it wasn't, you'll see that it wasn't super persuasive. So you've got the judge typing in the questions, the program typing in the answers. May I ask you some questions? Sure, ask me anything. Who composed Beethoven's Piano Concerto? Charlie Parker, smiley face. Now, that's actually not bad, because you could sort of imagine someone saying, well, who composed Beethoven's? It's, you know, the clues in the question, right? It's such an obvious question that maybe a human would not say, you know, would say Beethoven, you idiot. And so he's going to be sarcastic. So it's like, oh, maybe he's been sarcastic. That's not bad. OK, excellent. Can you name another composer of music for me? Thanks for the compliment. All right, so I was just pointing to the excellent. Uh, and it says two things in a row, right? It's a, this program, it takes two turns. Thanks for the compliment, Linus Torvalds. And it's like, okay, another composer of music. It's like, hmm, I don't know, okay. M maybe, you're, maybe you're trying to make a point there. I'm not sure. Uh, next question, have you heard of Casper Hauser? Cas have you heard of Casper Hauser? No, you see, you wouldn't have passed it either. Uh, he's a feral child story. Um, so the, the machine says, no, tell me about him, her, or it in just the way that a real human obviously wouldn't. Uh, later, maybe. When did the 1820 settlers arrive? I understand. <laughs> that, that is all water under the bridge. Judge, I agree, are you a computer? So you can see that this is the best that they could do in 2001, and it's not very convincing. There are some obvious flaws, including this thing where it takes two turns. Do you, do you understand what's happening when it takes two turns? Why, why does it do that? The yeah, exactly. It's just because it's got a very simple parser and it identifies this as two sentences because it's got a dot and a dot up here and it just responds to each sentence in turn. So it takes later maybe and it doesn't really know what that means. So whenever a chatbot doesn't know what to do, it says, I understand, <laughs> which you should always interpret as meaning, I don't understand. <laughs> uh, and then the second sentence is a when question, and it just knows that for when questions, if it doesn't have the answer in its database, it'll just say, water under the bridge, because that's a way to respond to when. Uh, and the same way up here, excellent, it says thanks, because it understands that excellent's a positive word. And, uh, and well, God knows why it thinks like this, but you, know, you can tell that it's, this is the, the, the real giveaway. I mean, look, people don't say things like that. Uh, but, of course, it doesn't have the context. When it hears an unknown thing, it doesn't know what, what are male pronouns or male names or female names. So it has to kind of say this. But it's a big giveaway. It could have been solved by using Tinder, Tinder, that. Yes, that, that's true. It could have neutralized it. Um, so uh, so that, that's the kind of thing that actually happened. So, again, Turing was not quite right about that one, uh, which is really annoying for me personally, because in the year 2001, when that happened, uh, I had been led to believe as a kid growing up in the you know, 70s and the 80s that we were going to have things like this. <laughs> yeah, so you, you, you know 2001, you've either seen it or you know about it. So 
I'll just show you a little bit, because in 2001, we're supposed to have HAL-like intelligence. And I'm sure that when, when Stanley Kubrick and, and Arthur C. Clarke wrote 2001, they, wrote, they made it in 1968. I'm pretty sure they did a lot of research. They'll have read Turing's paper or have known about it. So they would have known that Turing, this world expert, thought that you know, you'd have intelligent machines by the year 2000. And that's kind of why they thought, yeah, we can get away with that. It's, it's plausible. Aren't you just asking for a psychotic Amazon Alexa or Google Home? Well, that's true. Hal, Hal did take a strange turn, but, but I still like him anyway. Uh, so here's a little bit of Hal. I just I'll, might have to turn the volume up on the machine just so you can hear it a little bit better. Um, it doesn't always let me do full screen, annoyingly. His fault. It's kind of funny watching that when I, I put the, uh, the, cap, the captions on so you could make out the dialogue a little bit better. The captions, of course, are machine generated by AI. And all the times when I was growing up, this was one of the big unsolved problems of AI. It's like we couldn't even make them understand speech. You know, you had to type to them on keyboards. And it is, it's a really hard problem understanding speech. If you look at the waveforms, uh, you know, um, the, the gaps between words are not really audible. And there's a lot of variation in how people speak and practice a lot of when you're interpreting speech, you're kind of guessing because you already know the language, which is why it's so hard to understand Icelandic when you don't know it, because you're not speaking it properly. Um, so it's hard, you know, you don't really you don't really know the sounds until you, you almost can predict them. Uh, interpreting speech is a very predictive activity. Uh, and that was one of the great unsolved problems. We really couldn't do this at all until, I mean, maybe five years ago it got a bit better. I mean, Siri was a bit older than that, I guess, but it's that's been something that just really quite recently we've got to the point where we can actually uh, process speech well enough to transcribe it. It still made mistakes, as you might have noticed. They got some things wrong, uh, but it's you know a lot better than it used to be. But we still don't have HAL, which is a good thing and a bad thing, depending on how much you remember about the story. Uh, yeah. Could also go with show that. Hmm. Could also go with show that. More system shock approach. Oh, that, that, sorry, I'm a little bit um. unfamiliar. I mean, I've heard of it. But. Um, okay, so so Turing uh, Turing screwed up horribly, right? He got his 2000 prediction wrong, and he got his um, uh, memory capacity prediction wrong, and he got ESP wrong. But hey, prediction is difficult. 
especially about the future. I believe that at the end of the century, the use of words in general educated opinion will have altered so much that one will be able to speak of machines thinking without expecting to be contradicted. Alan Turing, 1950. And it's like, no. I mean, maybe colloquially you talk, sometimes talk about computers thinking, but you just mean, you know, they're waiting for something to come in from the desk. Nobody actually thinks that they think, right? We don't, you don't use it in the strong sense. So that just didn't happen. Um, this is the, this was from a, tw so I, I showed you the 2001 Loebner test. Just to show you how much it has come on since then, I took another snippet from 2013, which is still a bit old, but it's 10 years later, and it's still rubbish. Uh, Judge, I like waiting for Godot. What's your favourite play? Alice. I'm very patient. I'm not sure as I have a favourite play. My favourite actress is Katie Holmes. Who is your favourite actress? Maybe she's pretending to be like a kind of stupid teenage girl or something. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Who is your favourite actress? Judge, what emotions are you now feeling? Alice, I am unable to establish a network connection. <laughs> Are you a computer? Uh, so, you know, we've not done great on the chatbot front. But actually, even on chatbots, they're starting to get better. If you look at some of the very latest models, the kind of language models that they can do now, I'll, I haven't got time to talk about them in any detail, but there are now language models that can actually produce, you can tell them to write paragraphs of text that are like almost coherent. They give themselves away from time to time because they don't really understand things. Um, ultimately, they're based on statistical analysis. They just take in, like, you, you know, Google throws huge tons of data into these things, text, and the machine just basically learns the probability of certain words occurring after each other. So it sort of gets the idea of, like, what might come next in a sentence. It's about like predictive text on a phone. You know, you just do predictively write stuff out. Only better than that. But they don't really understand anything. They don't know what stuff means. So you can always trick them by asking them, a, like, a question about the actual properties of the world, you know, you know, where does rain come from or something like that. It's like they, they probably don't, they don't know anything. They just they just kind of imitate uh, certain patterns of speaking. But but they do so more convincingly than they used to. Um, however, here's a funny little thing. Um, so I used the term the, the ghost in the machine. That's a little joke about an idea called the ghost in the machine, which is one of these uh, philosophical idea about things. Um, but it turns out in 2014, which was the 60th anniversary of Turing's death, there was a chatbot uh, called Eugene Gustman that allegedly passed the Turing test, which is to say they sat it down, you know, they did one of these, it wasn't the Loebner Prize, it was a separate thing, but they sat it down and they had uh, the chatbot and a real human and again, you know, behind teletypes and an interrogator and they ran it through and apparently uh, the bot actually won. The bot managed to convince people that it was a human um, a couple of times, enough to meet the 70% threshold. Um, so this is a controversial claim uh, and disputed by some observers. For example, they might have faked this up. You know, they might have, uh, it was the 60th anniversary of Turing's death. Maybe the judges were told, go easy on the computers, eh? Because it's a better story if you say that they've passed. Um, and, and, and they were a bit cagey about the results. Like they didn't publish the transcripts for ages. They eventually did, and I read them and stuff. But it was, it was all kind of dodgy and murky. But there are also people who said that it definitely hasn't passed the Turing test. A lot of supposed experts said that, but I think the experts made a mistake because what they were really saying is it obviously isn't really intelligent. It's like, yeah, all experts know that. We know that we, we haven't got real you know, human level intelligence yet. So in that sense, no, it's not a human level intelligence, but it might have passed the Turing test because the Turing test literally says you have to just convince an, an sort of an average observer that you're the human uh, with more than you know 70 percent accuracy or something. Uh, which is like a doable thing, and it's only based on five minutes of conversation. I think it's actually got to the point where a reasonable chatbot that has got some of the tricks about, you know, the way chatbots can like pretend to know more than they do just by, you know, saying things like I understand when they don't. Um, naive observers don't know all the tricks and they could fall for it. So I think it's possible that it actually did, literally speaking, pass the Turing test. The problem is that passing the Turing test isn't really proof of intelligence. Because you can definitely imagine a not very good chatbot could maybe convince somebody after five minutes, uh, but you still wouldn't say that it was intelligent. So again, I think Turing got that wrong as well. I think the Turing test isn't good enough, but all you would have to do is say, you know, do it for half an hour. Right? If you can have a conversation for a half an hour and still convince you, that's a lot harder than to just do five minutes. And I think it would be hard to fake it. But it turns out five minutes of conversation with a bot probably is fakeable. One of these days you might find yourself talking to a bot online for five minutes and not realise that it's a bot? Has, has it happened yet? Has anyone been fooled by a bot in real life? You wouldn't know. 
You see, maybe, maybe some of your friends, your online friends are actually bots. No, probably not. But anyway, so we may or may not have actually passed the Turing test in the literal sense, but we certainly haven't created human level intelligence yet. We don't have that. I wrote a blog about all this, if you care, where I rant about this. Uh, OK, so where are we? Uh, well, it turns out, as I say, that chatbots are they're not absolutely dreadful nowadays. They have come along again in the past 10 years. Um, in part because of these large sets of data, you can just throw in tons and tons of digitized books and conversations and logs from chat servers. So you've got a lot of training data and you just put it into these kind of statistical machine learning things and they can sort of stitch together roughly what a sentence is like. Um, so this is an example that was done by a company that, uh, uh, that was trying to sell some system. So again, you got to take it with a pinch of salt. It's, uh, this isn't an academic paper. This is a promotional video made by a company that claimed to have done a chatbot, trained on a lot of like real world data, including like Twitter conversations and stuff like this. You know, you just take the Twitter fire hose and you train it up on it, and they get two of their bots to have a conversation with each other. To me, it's you know they could have totally faked it, right? But I think it's plausible that yeah, this is the kind of thing like a statistical language analysis thing could sort of do. You can tell that it sort of knows what the back and forth of a conversation is like, but it also doesn't really understand anything. And here's what you get. Hey Hallie, it's, nice to, be it's able nice to be able to talk to a woman for a change. So you don't, so you don't talk, talk often. often. That's right, but, That's there, right. Should but there should be limits. I don't know, but it's the but Twitter, it's the Twitter people. people. Who won't talk, who won't talk to me. Whispers. Whispers. Why? Why? Whispers. Whispers. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, 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 crazy, girl. crazy girl. Crazy for this girl is a song recorded by the American pop rock duo That's great. Do you know who I am? Why not? Why not? Have. Have. If I have forgotten, please remind me. I don't remember what you want to talk about. That's fine. In the lingo of the economist, the Ten Commandments talk about property rights. Marx thought that capitalism was about exploiting workers, but actually it's about property rights for everybody. That makes me sad. I am sorry, but... Okay, thanks for telling me. I'll keep that in mind. That's okay. Just don't do it again. Sad songs make me sentimental. You lied to me. Lying is bad. It makes me it sad. Makes me sad. I, didn't I didn't do anything. I tried to be I as responsive as, as I know how. Runs and runs fingers through your hair. Smiles looking up at you. Blushes deeply and looks at you. I really make really you that happy. Not smiling. Not smiling. You do. You, do. you, are, going you are going to get drunk again, again and, I and I am not to going to be here to take care of you. So please don't drink. How can I help you be here to take care of me? Nas, Nas, I want to be a big sister. Smiles. Smiles slightly before pulling him into a hug. Laughs and lifts you up in my arms, but I don't stop. I'll let you watch the rest of that one yourself before it gets too dirty. Um, but, you know, trained on Twitter, so this is the case you're going to end up with. Um, so, yeah, it's funny, but it's, you know, it's... It's always the kind of a joke, and it's not convincing, and yet, at some level, it's, you know, so that's where we are. It's not, we haven't got to the level of Hal yet, unfortunately. I'm still waiting for the real Hal to turn up. If the goal is intelligence, maybe you shouldn't use social media. As, the, as your benchmark. Again, see, it's, the, it's reconstructing intelligence through the human mold. It's like, is it intelligent to, to be a convincing Twitter person? <laughs> that, well, that depends, doesn't it? Um, so that's the end of part one of this thing, and I'll stop this recording.